Mr. Momo. She's a small business owner and uh, originally from Atlanta, but has been a transplant to the North Georgia mountains where uh, she's got a pretty view. So uh, we care about Georgia, we care what's going on in Georgia, and uh, I'll turn the mic over to uh, Ms. Gray. And thanks, Melissa, and all the groups, uh, Students for Progressive Society, the, the Politically Incorrect Club, and Students for Sensible Drug Policy for uh, stepping out there and inviting us out to discuss cannabis. Uh, about a year ago, I wouldn't have believed this would have been possible. So thank you guys for being here, everybody for coming, and uh, let's get busy. So today, Melissa's asked me to talk about a few things. First. Um, she wants me to talk about marijuana law reform in Georgia and give you an update on that. Uh, then she wanted to tell you, uh, she wants me to tell you how and why I got involved uh, with this movement uh, to legalize cannabis. And then I'm going to touch as well on some of the harms of prohibition. So now, uh, this year, we, I'm sure if you've been watching the news, have a medical marijuana bill is what they're calling it. Um, it, it will provide some medicine for some people. Um, the, the number of the bill is House Bill 885. I'm going to give you some good news and some bad news about it. The good news is that it passed through the House Committee, it went to the full House floor and was voted and passed 171 to 4. Huge numbers. Um, it has now been taken to the Health and Human Services Committee in the Senate. We have a meeting and a committee hearing on it on Wednesday at 2 o'clock. So you can uh, look on the news probably Wednesday night and see how that went. Um, the good part about it as well is that even though it's not near what we need or want, it started the conversation in the Gold Dome. Uh, last year, James, Bell, and I were down there, and people were literally laughing at us. Now they're not laughing so much. It's not such a laughing matter when you really dive into it. Um, we have also been able to look at who are our friends and our foes, depending on who's voting, how they're talking to the media. So we've got this book that's got every single legislator in it, and every time they make a statement or they give us a yes or no or maybe or I like this and not that we write it down in there and we're keeping up with that so that's a huge thing that's happening uh, that's helping us out now the bad news of course is it's very restrictive uh, they're relying on CBD oil only uh, for the children with with um, seizures that have been coming out asking for the medicine like the Charlotte's Web oil that they are producing for children with seizure disorders in Colorado they're also relying on the FDA and federal approval that seems to be quite problematic. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. And, and many people think that this is a symbolic only law. If it passes, that it won't get medicine to the children, won't get medicine to anybody. But it is a foundation that we're trying to build right now on which to grow. Our goal is normal. I work for normal. We are the national organization for the reform of marijuana laws. Our goal is federal and state legalization for responsible adult use and medical use for children decided by their physicians and parents. Contrary to popular belief, I don't want young people smoking cannabis. That's something that they bring out a lot. I oh, just want everybody to smoke pot. No, that's not the reason I'm here. The reason I'm here is because the harms of prohibition are hurting our children more than pot ever would, and I really don't want them to be smoking pot, but we've got to stop prohibition. So one marijuana arrest occurs every 42 seconds in the U.S. That means that 85 people will be arrested during this one hour conversation on cannabis. What will their future be and how will that affect the rest of us and society? So I'm going to give you a brief rundown of, since time is, is of the essence here, of why I got involved. My daughter was 19 years old. She was going to this very college. She was in her second year of college here um, and had some friends over that she hadn't seen from our town in a while. Uh, these friends came in. They were at our house for about an hour. I'm going to skip over all of this, but they left that night 
we went to bed and at 4 a.m. six hours after they left the SWAT team the Appalachian Drug Task Force and Lumpkin County Police Department was in my house with guns drawn looking for my daughter my 19 year old she lived downstairs we lived upstairs she had a little basement apartment type thing they asked me where she was and they took off running they pulled her out of bed with a gun to her head they were looking for pot they weren't looking for molotov cocktails didn't think she was a terrorist they were looking for marijuana we got i got upset and i had two options i could pull the covers over my head and be shameful and feel bad but i knew my daughter was not a criminal and the majority of the people in my town knew it as well i'm a business owner i was an ambassador with the chamber of commerce so what i did is i decided to get mad and angry and i started talking in my community at that point i started realizing that nobody else thought we were criminals either and I asked them to get involved. And the main thing that we got accomplished in that first two years was we had a sheriff. The sheriff that came into our house was not reelected. He lost by a two to one margin in the next election. Those are the kind of things that you can do on a local level. So what I started doing was telling my story, getting more, you know, our family story, getting more involved in it. And then I started hearing other stories. People started opening up to me. A few months later, I don't know if y'all are familiar with it, but Katherine Johnston was, was um, murdered. 37 rounds went into her body in Atlanta by the drug task force down there uh, on a botched drug raid. I really got upset at this point. And that's when I started telling other people's stories as well. And that's the way I go about my activism. During all this time, I was trying to find a focus. So I found my focus. My focus is, what about the children? So we're gonna go in and skip over some of the stories that I could tell you. There's thousands of them out there, and if you want to Google, you can find stories all over the country. But I'm gonna go to the stats for a few minutes. What about the children? We have 749,825 people arrested for marijuana violations. 88% of those people are for possession only. Georgia incarceration rate this uh, last year, in, or two years ago in 2012, we were seventh in the nation. We have been as high as second. To that, one in three children today will be arrested for a nonviolent drug offense before they turn 23. This is the problem. What if you are that one in three? If you're that college student like my daughter, you're gonna be arrested whether it be in your car, in your friend's car, that you didn't even have marijuana, but they did, or in your house, like my daughter was. You'll be taken to jail. You'll be offered a bond in front of a judge. Your parents will either choose or you will have the money to get out of jail or you won't. There's many people that don't have that money and they sit in jail, not being proven guilty, until they go to trial. There's thousands of them. Uh, felony or first time misdemeanor possession could land you up to one year in jail and a thousand dollar fine that's only the beginning a felony possession or intent to distribute you could get up to 10 years most people 90 percent 90 to 95 percent of the people that are arrested for marijuana end up with a plea deal the reason being is something similar to what my daughter was facing they found 1.5 grams of marijuana, not a lot, maybe two joints worth, a joint, maybe two, um, with, and then they also found a couple of pieces of paraphernalia. They also found an old grow light that her mother had from years ago that had never grown hot, I can assure you. But based on those things, my daughter was not only facing a misdemeanor charge, she was facing 26 years in jail for intent to distribute and distribution of 1.5 grams of marijuana. Manufacturing, not distribution. Uh, manufacturing, yeah. I'm sorry. She's here today with me. <laughs> um, so a conviction and criminal record uh, for children and, and students, uh, college age kids, uh, if you get past the jail and the bond and paying all your fines and doing your year or your year of probation or whatever you end up with in your plea deal, 
you if you don't get if you're not able to work a deal that where your expungement uh, you go uh, on to other things if you have this on your record your conviction and criminal record will land you loss of student aid there's been 200,000 students that have lost student aid and eligibility due to drug convictions I'm going to run down these real quickly and we can talk about them later if you have any questions some other things that can happen of course you can be expelled from school uh, you'll have a lot of difficulty finding employment there's a thing called a box that you have to check uh, we have people working on a, on a program right now in the Senate and the House um, about banning the box so if you get arrested hopefully you'll never have to check that box until you're 55 years old and getting your last job uh, there is a lifetime ban on federal and state assistance if you fall uh, into this situation you can't find a job um, you could possibly not even be able to get any kind of assistance while you're looking for a job from the state uh, parents can lose their parental rights It's happening not only here uh, because it's illegal but it also happens in states where it's legal for medical use there are parents having their children taken that are under law legally using cannabis for medicine in those states they're still having their children taken on the even worse note you can lose your right to vote after subsequent usually not on your first misdemeanor but if you have a felony or if it or you have subsequent subsequent arrest you can lose your right to vote you can lose your right to carry a firearm and you can also lose your uh, access to life-saving medical treatments the harms of prohibition again what about the children well let's take it from the very get-go when the kids get into elementary school they hear the dare program the dare program does not tell the truth about cannabis we don't want children using it we need to use honest education in order to um, teach our children the harms that it can do to a young mind okay so the dare people are talking all this stuff and just take this for instance you've been listening to dare for a long time you go to that first party you see your friends drinking alcohol and they're acting really silly being real silly then you see this other group over here and they're smoking a joint of cannabis or of marijuana they're not acting so silly they're sitting talking philosophy they're doing whatever maybe they're acting a little silly I don't know what they're doing honestly but they're you know but you're comparing the two groups and you're thinking wow I thought marijuana was as bad as heroin what have they been telling me were they lying and, and some kids will take that to the extreme and say well if they're lying about cannabis what else are they lying about and maybe when they see that line of cocaine at the next little room they may decide that huh maybe that's not so bad either that's a fear that parents have uh, drug testing we drug test kids for extracurricular activity that's brilliant let's take a, a kid that smoked a joint 30 days ago at a party and drug test him and tell him he can't be in the band you know let's take them and isolate them a little more and not give them positive reinforcement to try and help them uh, drug dogs constantly coming into our schools it's petrifying to these children they're scared to death I would know I've been in a bunch of them I used to work at the high school in Lumpkin County and at the middle school it happened in both places um, school to prison pipeline I'm not going to touch on that I just wanted to put it out there in case y'all want to go search it it's incredible what's going on there's a lot of reports out there how we are taking our kids and we're saying that parents cannot cannot teach them right from wrong they can't discipline them in their own home yet our police officers are arresting them when they don't know consequences for their bad behaviors uh, when they get older there's an underground un, I mean, an unregulated underground market to me this is one of the most important things we say that we're here to protect our children but we're allowing the underground market I can guarantee you anybody in middle school that wants a joint can buy a joint they may even be given a joint okay we need to take it just like we have alcohol and alcohol is not perfect there are still kids that get it but they have to do a couple of things and one of them is actually take an adult and and make them buy it for them that's not the case in the unregulated market a, a, a sixth grader can go out and buy marijuana drug dealers do not ID not saying all drug dealers would sell to a minor a lot of them would not but a lot of them will uh, children grow up 
Another problem, children are losing their parents to this rate of incarceration. Uh, they either are being raised by their other parent that's not in jail, they're going into foster care, or they're having to be raised by their grandparents. Another big issue. Uh, it's affecting not only the person that goes to jail, it's affecting the whole family. And of course, if you get young kids that have been arrested for marijuana a couple of times and they can't find a job and they can't get um, any um, help, funding to go back to school or to get a trade, they're obviously open to be recruited by the drug cartels. Drug cartels offer a lot of money. You don't have to do a lot of work. And if you have no opportunities to get education or to go to school and you have a record, that's the obvious choice. Now these are some of the faces of prohibition. The top one is Katherine Johnston, 82-year-old great-grandmother. She dies. What about her kids? What about her grandkids? What about her great-grandkids? To the right of her is Charlotte Figgy. She's one of the children that had to leave her state to go to Colorado. She is the child that is being helped by the CBD only oil, which actually has some THC, although it's a small amount, in Charlotte's Web, the big thing that we're talking about here in Georgia. Her family had to move. What about her little friends and her cousins and people that lived in her neighborhood and her family? Right here is, is Alan Peak and Haley. She is the Haley's Hope Act, that's HB 885. Alan Peak is the one that actually um, introduced the bill, and Haley is who is trying to protect. She has seizure disorders, and she will be moving to Colorado because we've wasted the last six weeks talking about stuff that we should have known when we started. Uh, but she'll be leaving on March 17th to go to Colorado to move to get this oil for her daughter. On the bottom left, um, this is uh, the Greens. Bree Green stayed in foster care for a solid year because her parents, good parents, nice home, were using medical cannabis in a legally medical state, Michigan. In the middle, this is Rachel Hoffman. One of the saddest stories I've heard, Florida State child going to school got caught with pot cops insisted that she be a confidential informant. She didn't want to turn in her friends because they weren't any big people either. So she was told that she needed to go out in order to keep her student aid and to not have a record. They sent her out to buy not pot, but ecstasy, methamphetamines, and a gun to try and set up some people that they've been trying to catch for a long time. She agreed didn't talk to her parents. They lost contact with her when she was out on that mission, and they found her two days later dead. This drug war is killing our children. It's affecting our kids, and we need to stop it. And not last but not least, these three officers are the ones that pled guilty and are sitting in jail for killing Katherine Johnston. What about their kids? Sorry, sometimes I get emotional. Please do. So all of this, zero recorded deaths of marijuana use in history. Why? What are we scared of? I'm not real sure. So what are we waiting on in Georgia? It seems like we're waiting on public support. And I've got some things out front that you can look at and you can also find them on our webpage. We have public support. Normal did, Peachtree Normal did, um, a, along with Georgia Normal, a poll this year in January, getting ready for this legislative session to see where the pulse of Georgia was. The pulse of Georgia says 54% of us want to legalize cannabis just like Colorado and Washington did in November of last year. 62% of us are not. 62% of us want to decriminalize it, which means stop the arrest. Make it a civil infraction if you're caught with it out in public. Stop busting down people's doors looking for it. And let's get busy on real crime. I am sick and tired of SWAT forces coming in on kids 
while we've got child molesters walking around with ankle bracelets in our neighborhood. We need to keep those kind of people in jail and stop trying to fill it up with marijuana smokers just because we don't like what they're doing. I don't really care what they do as long as they don't hurt someone else. So we're also waiting on federal, the federal okay in Georgia. That's a big thing. We want the feds to tell us that it's okay. Well, they haven't done that yet. Hopefully that'll come soon, but it hadn't happened yet. And to that I say, I love how us Republicans, and I say us because I am one, want to comply with federal law on this issue. Yet when it comes to the federally mandated Affordable Health Care Act, it's just cool to say kiss off. We're not going to follow your rules. Finally, we have spent a trillion dollars on our drug war and trying to eradicate marijuana. We have had, it has, um, zero stated goals have been accomplished. We arrest, on, in the last 10 years, anywhere from 700 to 850,000 arrests on marijuana every year. This drug war has failed. Prohibition doesn't work to keep drugs from our children and it doesn't promote public safety. In fact, it does the exact opposite. Prohibition doesn't work. If it did, I'd be all for it. It hasn't, it never will, and we cannot arrest our way out of this. It's time for this honest discussion. I appreciate everybody being here, and we're gonna have some questions and answers in a little bit, and I'm gonna bring James Bell up here in just a second. I'm about done, James. Uh, and um, we need to talk about sensible drug policy. If you need to talk to anybody about it, that would be Jeremy Sharp. He's the, he's the, new, uh, the new rock star in this movement in Georgia. Um, it's time to choose a side, honestly. I hope that the judicial system, the public, and the law enforcement folks pick our side because we're on the right side of history. The other side includes the drug cartels and they're vying for their vote too. We are now in the marijuana majority, not just because of the benefits of cannabis, but because of the harms of its prohibition and how it's affecting our families. It's time for everybody to get involved. Thank you very much. All I can say is wow. Uh, I've heard Sharon speak a lot, actually, and every time I hear her speak, uh, I still get the same feeling. Um, there's a lot of passion in this movement. Uh, we put a lot, a lot of hard work into what we do. Um, nobody really pays us. A lot of things that we do come out of our own pockets, and it is a grassroots movement. Um, we need individuals. We need people at the Capitol. We need people calling their senators, their legislators, sending those emails, sending those posts on Facebook. Um, get past the fact that your uh, your cousin doesn't like that, you know that that Facebook message. Um, if you believe in what we do, um, stand beside us. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce James Bell. He's our uh, he's our next speaker. He's a Georgia native. Uh, I've seen him a lot on WSB TV and a lot of the news networks. Uh, he's kind of become somewhat of a local celebrity in our movement. Uh, James is the uh, director of Georgia Care and. Uh, He's really, really involved in the legislative process and what's going on with uh, HB 885, uh, which I will encourage you guys to look at. Uh, it's online. Um, if you want to look at it, I can get access to it. Uh, I don't have any printed out, but uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to James and uh, let him speak about what he does. <laughs> Strong. Just X out of it. Well, good afternoon. <laughs> I, I, am I good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. I'm good to see this uh, good turnout today. And uh, it's a pleasure to always come and talk about cannabis, the movement, um, the projects we're involved in. Um, let me ask you one thing. How many were alive in 1987? That's when I got started um, in the marijuana legalization movement. Eight years uh, I've, I've actually been arrested twice in my lifetime, uh, 82 and 92. 
um, somehow made it through 12 and <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've avoided arrest since then but uh, I've had some uh, certainly issues with, with uh, being arrested uh, as uh, one of our famous rock stars says I don't have a drug problem I have a police problem and uh, I certainly have had a police problem in my life um, my second offense I was caught with four ounces of marijuana um, I sold uh, some marijuana to a friend of mine. A friend of mine set me up. I uh, spent 730 days in the state state system, in the state prison system, and that was two years of uh, time that uh, certainly I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about um, uh, society, and I vowed to myself that at some point in my life I'm going to continue to fight. Uh, to legalize and to legalize freedom in this country. We pretend that this is a free nation, but yet um, our government has decided there's certain things that we can't do in our lives uh, that has no rationale behind them. And the, the marijuana issue is one of, one of those. Um, I, I, formed, I originally formed Georgia Normal back in the 80s. Um, we did some big events uh, in Atlanta, drink, brought, drawing attention to uh, the legalization issue. Uh, I was out of uh, out of activism for a while. I got back involved in being an activist in my local town with uh, some tax matters and being uh, just a, involved in and being a good citizen in my neighborhood and uh, kind of pushing back on government intrusion and uh, and organizing my neighbors, etc. And then and then two thing, a couple things happened a couple years ago. Uh, Colorado and Washington State. Uh, voted to legalize cannabis in their state. To me, that was a sign that this this nation had uh, has certainly changed. Something has changed. During the 80s and 90s, we had the war on drugs. We had 85% uh, of the population said they were willing to give up their constitutional rights in order to fight the war on drugs. And today, we're having 50 to 60, 50 to 65% of the people saying legalize marijuana. So certainly, as time goes on, as decades pass, so do policies and so do these, these, um, um, these fear tactics that people use about the war on drugs. Let's face it folks, the war on drugs is a failure. It's over. It's over. Uh, we spent billions of dollars. We destroyed millions of lives. We've killed millions of law enforcement, millions of, uh, I'm sorry, not millions, certainly tens of thousands of law enforcement, tens of thousands of citizens. People are being killed on the Mexican border right now um, uh, for marijuana, drugs, other drugs coming across because why? Because of prohibition, because our government has determined that, that they want to put it in the black market and allow the, the uh, profiteers and the cartels to sell their poisons around the world. And then we have marijuana. Uh, it's certainly a different category than any other uh, substance out there. Uh, I think, uh, you know, without raising your hands, <laughs> uh, certainly people in this room have ex experimented or possibly even use it daily. Uh, we know that it's relatively safe. We know it's at least as safe as alcohol and tobacco. We know that it can be regulated and controlled like alcohol and tobacco. Uh, arresting people today makes no sense. They can't justify it. If there's no moral grounds. There's no no public safety grounds. There's no um, uh, no other reason that I can come up with why the government should intrude into our lives. And when we think about this, we think we got to think about our individual freedom and our liberty and what these laws do to us. And we need to be stop being so um, apathetic to the fact that our government tries to control every aspect of our lives. And I think the marijuana issue certainly uh, is a part of that. Um, so I formed Georgia Care, the Campaign for Access, Reform, and Education. And it was a, I, I heard about Sharon. They were, she had uh, reorganized a normal chapter here in town uh, and had been watching that. And uh, since I've been involved with Normal, I, I want to do something a little bit different. Uh, so I formed the, uh, uh, the Georgia Care Project, and we set out with my friend Ron Williams to uh, pull together an organization that can lobby, that can uh, be a voice, be a face for the issue, 
and that's what we try to do. I know everyone, not everyone, everyone in this room may not necessarily be an activist, but uh, there are things that you can do. But what we want to do is be the voice and be the face for the issue and be able to uh, pre present policy, present debate, and to come out and talk with uh, good people like you to to maybe just get this discussion going. And hopefully, when you leave here, that. Uh, it goes beyond this room here. You're going to go share it with someone, hopefully, about what we talked about here today. And that's what we're doing. I call it planting seeds. So hopefully if you plant a seed in somebody's mind, that it will grow into something that uh, perhaps will spark some interest. And, and uh, you have a great opportunity now to be involved. And I just encourage you, whatever you have a skill or a talent or something, you can contribute to the organizations. And if you don't like working with organizations, do something on your own. Just do something on your own that you can make one change. Uh, when we deal with uh, the state of Georgia, we have one of the uh, most, um, <laughs> one of the most terrible places to live as far as incarceration. We were, we're, we're number one in incarceration and we're on the bottom in education. And for 40, 50 years, we've spent, we've misspent our money. We misdirected our money. And you see what we got. We've got, we've got some, some of the, the most grand uh, prison facilities in the world, and we got some of the, the poorest school systems in the world, and, um, and certainly uh, our politicians have missed the mark when it comes to prioritizing our money and prioritizing education and prioritizing public safety, because every time a person is arrested, that's one other person who's committing a crime against a person or stealing your property that is not being dealt with. And uh, I look at it this way, there's only a couple of crimes in this world. That's a crime against an individual and a crime against the property that you own. If they're stealing your property and hurting you, those are the two crimes that I feel our government should be focused on. Uh, you know, under, under the state constitution, there's a right of conscience. I include that uh, to be consciousness and to be able to determine what goes on between these two ears it's none of your business and it's none of our government's business what I do in my own mind. And so that's where we come down to what purpose does the government have being involved? And when you get down to asking them to rationalize uh, their, uh, their nonsense, there's no answers to that. It's because prohibition is prohibition. It's illegal, therefore it's illegal. And we're going to continue the same policy. But fortunately, um, attitudes are changing. And, Ironically, I found in today's, uh, is this not the Gainesville? Yeah, the Gainesville Times, an article here. Uh, State oversight maintain California marijuana shops. It gets into the issue, you know, we, we talk about California and other, and other places that have medical, would expect California to be one of the first places to legalize, but they're not. So, odd enough, the... Um, it's the police chiefs association took a poll of their membership and their police chief says 90 percent of them say we want we want some legalization in, in colorado for personal use they're wasting their time and effort and resources going after people so they drafted their own bill and are going to present it to the their legislature there hopefully for a public vote so certainly attitudes are changing around the country um, Again, I mentioned that prohibition of marijuana is not about public health, it's not about public safety, it's about profiteering. Uh, we hear a lot about these drug courts, uh, this, this so-called criminal justice reform we see in Georgia. Uh, they're moving people out of the prison system into local uh, corrections uh, type of programs, ankle bracelets, drug testing, etc. This is so they can profiteer off of us, okay? This is just another way of shifting uh, resources. Uh, it sounds great, we don't want to lock up nonviolent offenders, but we don't have a problem putting ankle bracelets on them or, or, take, or extracting the urine and blood from us and, uh, and, and testing that. So uh, again, another way to uh, extract money from the public and these private drug testing, probation, uh, even prison uh, companies are profiteering. And uh, so hopefully we're going to shift away from that in this state. Um, Sharon and I have been lobbying for the past two years. We've been working together. We've got a great group of people around the state that have been doing their part, showing up at the Capitol, 
showing up, uh, doing phone calls, uh, emailing our legislators and letting them know we want changes in the law. Uh, we want legalization. We want legalize the freedom. We want to legalize cannabis. And if we get medical, that's a great thing. But if we can legalize it, decriminalize it, uh, I call it harm reduction. Uh, we're looking to do things as, as lobbying. We advocate. We do white papers. We do these position papers that help to hopefully guide our lawmakers into where we we see where we should be going with our policy. We look at things like uh, incremental steps, like decriminalization or maybe citations for less than an ounce of marijuana, as we, as Sherrod mentioned. Uh, an ounce. I, I do this demonstration. I wish I brought this probably a tobacco-free location, but I do these demonstrations with two bags of tobacco. One's 27 grams. One's 29 grams. One represents one year in state prison. The other represents 10 years in a state prison. That's what the difference is in the law. And when people look at these two bags and say they're in, indistinguishable, then why should there be a one to ten year prison term for virtually the same crime? Crime. Uh, and so it, I'm hoping it's helping to get people to understand that these laws are so draconian and out of step. Uh, you know, these, Sharon mentioned about the, the polls. 62% of likely voters want to decriminalize marijuana in this state. When we, um, you know, it takes 50 plus one vote to get elected in this state, okay? We're talking landslide numbers here. So these politicians are out of step with society. They're out of step with, um, with, with the trends. They're out of step with the voters of this state and hopefully the voters. By the way, how many, how many are registered to vote? Excellent, excellent. If you're not, please register to vote. It's important. These issues will be coming up at some point. This is election year. People, uh, we need to put them on record as to where they stand on um, on this policy. Um, if there are incumbents, ask their opponents where do they stand. Uh, let's put them on record. It's time that they speak up. I don't want to, someone to tell me, well, I'm not quite sure. Well, you need to be sure. There's, if this issue is too urgent, there's too many people. We mentioned about the arrest. We've got 30,000, 30,000, somebody do the calculation. 30,000 divided by 365 days. How many is that, 80 something? We're arresting 80 something people a day in Georgia. While we've got prosecutors in Atlanta complaining that they don't have money to prosecute child offenders. 82? Okay, so break that down. How many people have already been arrested since we've been here? Think about that. Um, so, let's see, what else? Uh, pharmaceuticals, what are we doing? What are we gonna do? What's gonna happen if we legalize marijuana? You know, one of, probably one of the biggest opposition here is the big, big pharma, the pharmaceutical companies that are out there pushing their poisons. While we got lawmakers that are worried about a, a somebody getting high on a medicine, or somebody having a, an increase in appetite, or someone actually having feeling pleasure from a medicine instead of pain and misery. Uh, we, on the other side, we have these pharmaceutical companies that are dumping these chemicals into our children, and in, and possibly even someone in this room has probably taken some of these chemicals, and you probably felt the side effects. Have you ever seen the TV commercial where it says, uh, "Ask your doctor if this drug's right for you"? After they just told you that it's going to cause a swelling of your tongue, that if your, your gums are going to bleed, that you're going to have increased thoughts of suicide, that, uh, you know, it goes on and on. And they say, ask your doctor if this is right for you. I would say no. I, I, I don't want your drugs. If my, teeth, if my gums bleed and my tongue swells and I have increased thoughts of suicide, I probably don't want your medicine, okay? So a lot of people are sensing this, that cannabis is becoming, it's not becoming, it has been a miracle medicine for, for, for forever. Ever since we've been able to harvest the plant, we've been using the plant. And here we are, full, full circle again. The momentum is headed in that direction. By the way, how much time do we have? Probably a question. Yeah. Okay. Just a couple more minutes, and, I, and what questions do you, you might have? Think about that, because we'll have a little Q&A session here. Um, 
Another issue that's really bothering me is this so-called synthetic marijuana you've been hearing, hearing about. It's a synthetic poison. It is not marijuana. It is not cannabis. Uh, it does not mimic the effects of marijuana. Please do not use it. Please tell your friends do not use it. Uh, you don't know what it is. One batch may be okay. The next batch may you either end up uh, with some type of psychosis or in the hospital or having some kind of uh, physical or mental issues from that. Do not do synthetic poisons. I don't care what your friends say. Um, there's nobody ever been harmed or um, uh, certainly no one has died from, in to uh, from the tox from any toxicity from marijuana. So don't confuse the two. They are not similar. They are not the same thing. Um, we talked about, Sharon talked about some of the victims, and I want to kind of turn the table a bit and say, I will say that our law enforcement have been uh, victims also. They've been given a task. You know, uh, you don't know what it's, unless you've had a shotgun in your face, uh, you don't really know, you know, they don't know what's going to be placed in their face either. They're, they're, they're taking on this job to go out. The, the po politicians have given them the task to go out and solve a public safety or, a, I'm sorry, a, uh, a, a public health issue with a public safety uh, program. Uh, drug use, legal or otherwise, cannot be solved by law enforcement. Certainly we can have laws against driving under the influence and things that affect other people. But people have a uh, have uh, some sovereignty to do what they want in their own lives and to, and to live their lives as they see fit. So we, law enforcement have been put in this position um, and maybe they've been put in that position or they put themselves in that position to, for instance, in the case of uh, Catherine Johnston, where it was a botched drug raid, instead of saying, okay, we've made a mistake, we've killed this woman, this innocent woman, they go around and plant a nickel bag of marijuana in her back door and claim that she was dealing drugs uh, in order to justify what they did. So 30 sheriffs in the state of Georgia in the past 30 years have been arrested for drug or narcotics or some type of uh, conspiracy charges involving the war, the war on drugs. It's corrupting law enforcement. Uh, it, <laughs> so at what point do we say that this is just nonsense and we've got to change this? So that's what Sharon and I are trying to do. We're trying to educate people that we are moving in that direction to, uh, to end prohibition, to bring about some form, you know, and of course we argue amongst ourselves. We've got people that are critical of us because we supported a bill that doesn't really accomplish what needs to be accomplished. We get people who uh, say, you know, forget about medical, we want to legalize if we legalize it over here, we can get medicine over here. A lot of different strategies, a lot of things at play. All we want to do is advocate and keep pushing the policies forward and let's deal with the issues as they come forward. So um, I think that's about it. I just wanted to thank, say thank you for being here, by the way. Make sure you tell someone. Uh, our website is gacareproject.com. Uh, anybody been to gacareproject.com? Okay, we've got a few hands here. That's where we, that's our headquarters. That's where we post all of our latest information on the bills, uh, et cetera. We have a Facebook page, GA Care Project, uh, on Facebook, and uh, come join us. If uh, we do public speaking, as you can see, and if you know of anyone else that would like to uh, participate in these type of forums, we do have events. Uh, did you talk about the conference? I did not. Well, come you on, know, please. No, you please tell about the conference. I forgot to tell y'all, we do have a conference, um, Peachtree Normal's putting it on. It's going to be held on March 22nd. Um, it is from, or registration starts at 8, uh, the festivities start at 9, go to 6. And we are going to have Neil Franklin with Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, um, several doctors, um, some clergy all coming together for the Southern Cannabis Reform Conference. You can find information and tickets. Um, on our Peachtree Normal front page at www.peachtreenormalnorml.org. Um, it's going to be an incredible day, lots of activists coming together, uh, and we're going to do a lot of question and answers as well there. So if we don't answer your question today, come to that. If you by chance need a scholarship, you can also ask for one of those. We've got a few more scholarships left. And students, there is a student discount as well.
-hmm. But if you can't handle that and you want to come, let us hit us up for a scholarship. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just will say thank you to Jeremy and for uh, everyone else involved and in helping helping us. I see a lot of faces that uh, I see faces all over the state that we meet on the streets. We meet at, play, at various events and. Uh, it's really good to see that people are recognizing uh, what we're doing, and, and, uh, and I, I recognize we, we're not doing this alone. <laughs> There's people out there that are helping us in many ways. I mean, uh, you know, it's called a big roller coaster ride. I feel like we're the only ones that care about this issue at times, and then other times we get these uh, emails that thank us and call us heroes and all that stuff, and uh, it really keeps us going and motivates us to keep continuing on because we know it's important to a lot of people. I wish you could read some of the emails I get from some of the patients, uh, people that say uh, cannabis helps me, or those stories, the tragic stories of their arrest, involvement with law enforcement, how it's destroyed their lives, their jobs, their careers, and uh, so hopefully um, we're gonna we're gonna change this, and hopefully uh, uh, you're gonna help us. Please help us. All right, guys, we're going to turn this over for uh, some questions and answers. So uh, does anybody have any questions for our speakers? That they're willing to ask in public? Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm sure there's a question out there. I, I mean, uh, no? Okay. Yeah, no, were we that good? Work? We got yeah, all this information going. <laughs> well, I see you. Uh -huh. uh, well, I, what I was going to say, I know that Georgia does have some agricultural things, but what is the legalization? benefit us also economically adding another aspect to our trade you know be you know in state and between states and so forth absolutely we didn't really even touch on that I've got another presentation for that we can do that <laughs> yeah about the millions I mean look Colorado made a million dollars the first day they started selling marijuana I mean okay <laughs> they've been making a million dollars every day their, their uh, Governor Hickenlooper just came out and said by fiscal year 2015, so that will be a whole year and a half, their fiscal year, year ends at the end of June. So this whole year plus January through June of this year, they're looking at a billion dollars. Okay, so there's a lot of that. And hemp as well, you brought up agricultural, huge as far as hemp. And we are working, uh, James and I actually were over speaking to Gary Black, what, about a week ago? week, week and a half ago, about the hemp. He is our, Gary Black is the agricultural uh, head of Georgia. So uh, hemp is being pushed as well. Uh, my daughter that got arrested actually is going into that, that field, hemp field. Uh, she's a landscape architect. Uh, since we paid 15 grand to get her out of trouble, she ended up uh, using most of her college funds, so she's a little bit in debt now, but that's okay. <coughs> Hickenlooper. Oh, what a great name. I, know. I thought she was making that up. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, the hemp issue. That's uh, that's something that's, that's one of my pet issues. I, I just see, uh, I see Kentucky, I see Colorado, uh, other states, probably 10, 12 other states that have hemp laws. Uh, by talking to the Ag Commissioner, uh, I'm talking to farmers. I got farmers calling me and say, I'm already a farmer. I'm growing uh, grain crops. Uh, I want to grow hemp, and uh, so how do we take this biomass that can grow, be grown almost anywhere in this state, um, and use it as an agricultural crop, and um, you know, from everything from shoelaces to car parts, uh, make cellulose and plastics and Concrete. and right. oils and. Mm -hmm. Uh, this shirt's actually 100% hemp, just to let you know. It is 100% hemp, so. Now everybody's going to want your sleeve here. There was a 1938 article in Mechanics Illustrated, I believe, that said hemp was a billion dollar industry. That was back in 1938. There 25,000 products. Translated to today's money, that's probably uh, a lot. <laughs> several million dollars, and probably the number of products has doubled or tripled in that time. Well, let's think about this. With, with 20 states with medical, how many uh, people out there are going, to, you know, are going to med school and 
wanting to be doctors or nurses or et cetera that could get into this field. You look at uh, everything surrounding the industry from the security companies to the grow lights to the uh, the lawyers are now, you know, dealing with the legal issues of the legal side, not the illegal side in these states. So nobody's losing money here. Everybody's profiting off of this. So there is a, a you know, I believe in a free market. I believe if you let the free market go, that it will, it will fix itself and people will find their place in the industry. So yeah, money to be made in this in this um, in this industry. We've got entrepreneurs right now in the state of Georgia that are looking at the medical law, saying, I want to be the first to be the uh, dispensary here in Georgia so people are looking to the uh, to their uh, to the states and I think about you know who in Georgia what doctor in Georgia knows anything about cannabis and you know you might find a handful of doctors but we've got nine million people uh, if we do legal if it was legal today who, who would know how to how to uh, deal with, even talk about the issue that's something that's something that that just brought up something that when when they have these medical states a lot of the people that don't want it legal or that don't like medical they point to exactly what he's saying there's only four doctors that are giving out all the marijuana you see how they turn things it, we have to educate them and like he was saying these doctors coming into this new field that is a that is something that some of the doctors that are in the field are working towards they're going to these med schools saying that these children that are coming into medical school learn about the nervous system, the, the immune system, the everything. They need to start learning and teaching the endocannabinoid system to our children because this is coming. There is no stopping it. So we need to start, if you know anybody that's out in pre-med, ask them to start spreading the word about getting that involved. Just, just uh, general use of cannabis, the legalization of cannabis. I would regulate like alcohol and tobacco. I would, it, it, you know, look, I'm a libertarian, so I'm not much into regulations and taxation and all that. But if that's what it takes, for some reason, taxation uh, uh, eliminates all sins. You know, in Georgia, uh, gambling used to be a sin, considered a sin, and then they came up with this idea, hey. We're going to make billions of dollars off of uh, off the lottery system. So, and for some reason, uh, for some reason, gambling's not as bad as it used to be. So I'm thinking the same way. If we have to regulate it, if we have to tax uh, tax it. By the way, I was the first Georgian to voluntarily pay marijuana tax uh, in 1990 or so. Uh, they actually created a law in the books that said we're going to tax it at three dollars and fifty cents per gram. I said, okay, I'm going to go down and pay it just to show them that it can be regulated and controlled and people would be willing to pay taxes. And, you know, it, it really, really uh, makes me mad to hear people in Colorado and other places complaining about paying a little taxes on their marijuana. I would gladly swap their, uh, their policies with them any day. Uh, I would pay a little, little bit in, in uh, taxes in order to... Uh, to have, have a little freedom, and uh, unfortunately, that's what is, is coming up. Coming up, politicians seem to uh, um, s seem to go along with taxation for some reason. So, okay. to, add, to add to that, um, talking about taxing it, we've got to be careful not to tax it too much, because in all reality, that's what Colorado's done at this point. They've got a 37, 35, whatever. There's there's different step so anyway I think the total is 37 percent I could be wrong don't quote me on that you can buy illegal marijuana in Georgia for cheaper than you can buy it in Colorado we have to be careful if we really want to get rid of the drug cartels and the violence that's going on on our border and the violence in our neighborhoods and the violence in our inner cities we're going to have to keep we're going to have to find the balance of regulation and taxation. You see what I'm saying? We can't ever tax it because the black market will still thrive. That's not my purpose. I want the black market gone. Just, I don't think it'll ever go away. I'll add that, but to some degree. To be specific, 
we would want a plan that would allow for an individual to cultivate their own. Uh, if you can't cultivate your own, I should be able to go to a friend and say, hey, can you accommodate me without worrying about being arrested? Uh, whatever, uh, you know, there's, there's a thousand plans out there, uh, dozens at least, uh, on, on how to regulate and how to, how to control it. What, what's best for Georgia? We need to look at that. And we've offered a plan. If you go to our website, uh, gacareproject.com, you'll see that we have a plan uh, there that lays out what, has, what needs to happen in order to, uh, to, to legalize. Uh, guys, I know it's getting one, uh, close to 1.15. Uh, we're going to take a couple more questions, uh, but I would like to encourage everyone that is student, that are students here to uh, come to our Tuesday meeting in meeting room three in the student center. Uh, we meet uh, every Tuesday at 12 o'clock from 12 to 1. Uh, Wednesday but, uh, through Is there any more questions out there? Uh, these are very well experienced people. I don't know if you guys are doing reports or just interested. Uh, you know, a lot of this information has been well researched. Um, so I encourage you to uh, think of something real quick uh, to ask these guys. <laughs> uh, or forever hold your peace. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess we'll close it up. I mean, might as well. Uh, I think most people are uh, needing to get to class as well. Um, I would like to thank everybody who has stayed and has come and uh, spread the word, get involved. Uh, we're out there. You can find us. Uh, and then the second you contact you, us, we will get back in contact with you as soon as possible and tell you how to get involved. Uh, something we believe in. Uh, we've dedicated our lives to uh, changing these things because we're nowhere right. And uh, you know, and I don't mean to sound arrogant saying that, but um, no, we're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, All right, thank you guys. <laughs>